This is NextGenWeb.org continuing its coverage of the NCSL annual meeting in Boston, and we're joined now by Brian Mefford, who's the CEO of Connected Nation. And Brian, we appreciate you joining us today. Glad to be with you. Well, Connected Nation and, and the Connect Kentucky model certainly has been a big part of the, of the discussion here in terms of how we can sort of alleviate that broadband gap between the haves and have-nots of broadband. And um, certainly part of your success with that model has been public-private partnerships. I was wondering if you could talk about why that has been so successful in alleviating the broadband gap. Well, I appreciate it. And you know, I think what's, what's so exciting to folks here at the NCSL meeting is, is attributed to the fact that the model that we've employed through the public-private -private partnership uh, is so highly transferable to every state and, and literally to, to every community because it is so adaptable. And, and the, the flexibility that is allowed uh, and, and that is a function of bringing private companies together with uh, those agencies and those stakeholders from the public sector who've, who have this vested interest in technology growth, it, it allows for uh, just a, a customized approach uh, and, and, and adjust, to, adjust to the facts on the ground. And so that it, it takes this discussion out of the conceptual realm and makes it a more practical uh, roll up the sleeves and get the work done uh, kind of approach. Now, mapping has been a big part of that, and I know, Kentucky, you all put together a pretty comprehensive map of where there was service, where there was no service, and can you give any examples or talk about when you identify a pocket where there's no provider, sort of the process by which you identify a provider and, and, and bring supply and demand together? Sure, and I mentioned yesterday the fact that providers are, are eager participants in this entire process, and so... Uh, telecom providers, cable providers, these are companies that want to make these investments. And so part of the mapping exercise is to bring everybody together and, and identify then where these gaps are because uh, as an individual company, I know where my footprint is. I don't necessarily know where my competitors' footprints are. And so as we bring all the data into one place, uh, it helps us, it helps the entire provider community say, oh, this area here is unserved and we didn't, didn't actually know this. And so once we identify those gaps, then we, we begin to overlay other, other data sources like you know, household density and, and, and other uh, type information about potential take rates and perceptions related to uh, incoming technology. And we can begin to formulate uh, a very, very high level of, of market intelligence for these areas uh, that's immediately helpful. Uh, it identifies just as a visual immediately low-hanging fruit, but then you know, we're able to drill down, of course, into those unserved areas uh, and get to, to a level of, of understanding about uh, these gaps that allows us to make very strategic decisions. And there seems to be, at least here amongst the, the state representatives, pretty wide acceptance of the model and, and deploying it elsewhere. Are there any roadblocks or do you see any, any hindrances of being able to do that nationwide? I, I know Tennessee is underway. Um, do you see other, other states sort of jumping at the chance to, to get this model underway in, in their states? There are a lot of states that are interested, and in, in we've heard from, from nearly every state in the country uh, with, with some level of interest. I think that the turning point is, and we've heard it here at this meeting uh, this weekend, the turning point is when we are able as any given state to acknowledge this issue as a key infrastructure issue, as a core infrastructure issue. And so as we uh, certainly uh, never want to understate the importance of the traditional infrastructure, roads and water and sewer, we have to acknowledge that broadband infrastructure has become, uh, as was stated earlier today, the 21st century infrastructure. And so uh, as states can acknowledge that, then other things tend to fall into line, like funding and like, uh, like a reg regulatory environment that says, okay, we, we acknowledge this as a, a piece of core infrastructure and we're going to put the things in place that, that allow us to ensure that the environment is right for investment continuously. Well, Brian, it's a great program, and we appreciate your time talking about it with us today. Thank you. It's good okay. to be with you. This is NextGenWeb.org reporting from the NCSL annual meeting in Boston.